So have you heard that that there's a lot of in the African American community there's a lot of people that do not want to wear wear masks. They're very reticent about wearing masks because of the uh, because of uh, they feel that it attracts um, yeah it attracts police it, it attracts police uh, you know looking at them and things. Yeah, it's a it's a white privilege. Wear mask. There we go. There you go. You look good. You are, I've I've got a good one too. My mother made a really good one. Oh, really? I don't know if I can walk out out. Outside with this, you know, uh, African American, brown, whatever, uh, for them, uh, you know, it's a luxury. It's a, it's a, it's a, it's a life threatening that you act normally. As we are living in uh, lockdown and uh, and uh, uh, trying to kind of cope and understand uh, this COVID nineteen, Corona, the pandemic, and uh, it, it has its major uh, uh, impact and effects uh, on, on finance on uh, our financial uh, institution and our political institution also economic infor- uh, institution and it is you know it's unfolding between uh, before our eyes we really we do not know uh, what uh, uh, how we're gonna out of this and what how it's gonna pan pan out you know my 40 years in this country uh, my family in Egypt uh, are worried about me. <laughs> they are, people are, uh, around the world, they have pity on, on Americans. So we have here our guest, uh, uh, Jim Kalkoff, who is an economist, and he was uh, uh, the t- a chief, uh, t- uh, a chief economist for Agri- Agribank uh, District uh, during uh, the, that uh, financial crisis. So welcome to Bil Ahdan, uh, uh, Jim. Uh, that, uh, Two scenario there: how center planned in China, you know, communists react to it, and how free market economy uh, react to it. And you know, yeah, well, uh, earlier, early on when the crisis was still just beginning, uh, President Trump actually said something right. One of something that he said that was actually correct was that the uh, getting the economic part of it wrong can be worse than getting the uh, the the medical part of the pandemic wrong. In, in terms of costing more lives, and he's absolutely right about that. If you get the econ- the an economy in a modern capitalist economy, is basically a, a, a life support system for dense urban economies. And if for some reason you can't get the food or or other supplies that people need to survive, you could actually cause a lot more de- death just by either food famine, housing famine, uh, medical shortage famine, um, uh, things like that can actually kill a lot more people. So the so the economic part. Is uh, is something to consider uh, that that has to be considered as part of the as part of the. It's not like a luxury that you can put off uh, to 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 uh, when when trying to resolve the the pandemic. And I think there's been a lot of the. You had a question about the. Um, uh, yeah, basically, how does a free market economy uh, deal with it differently than uh, than um, more of a command type of economy and maybe maybe a political system. Of how China might 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 be dealing with it different than the U.S. It uh, one thing that what was what struck me about that that question is that one thing to consider is that is that um, and this is you know for example the, the the global consulting firm McKinsey did studies on private corporations trying to do change initiatives where they try to do some some major difference in the way of operating than they have been before and it also correlates pretty well with what with what policy study scholars have known. Uh, for the last 40 or 50 years in, in how uh, large government organizations work. Se- 70% of government or private initiatives to do something different, which is the equivalent of doing a, a policy response to some emergency like a pan- pandemic, fail. They don't, they fail to get implemented. So failure is normal and to be expected. And so uh, what we've seen is, a, is, is huge failures in China, at least at the beginning, even to recognize they had of a pandemic and it really caused it to, to explode. And uh, that's, that's at least what the information we, we, we have so far makes it look like. And, and I know when it was developing in, in uh, December and January and the news coming out of it seemed like that there may be some, some case of that. There was also a very strong policy response uh, failure on, um, in Western liberal market economies. Uh, as well, largely a failure to recognize the seriousness of the problem and to and to take steps um, um, dramatically. Even even using kind of a top-down government policy, which the Trump administration did, uh, essentially trying to close off visitors from China, 
um, from from coming to the U.S. They really didn't close the they, they they closed off Chinese citizens coming in. Was what the ban, but the but the virus was already in U.S. citizens that were there trying to come back to the country, and there was just a failure to recognize that this is going to be a problem that we have to deal with. And to set up, it could have easily been solved by just renting out hotels and making people stay there if they came back from any foreign country for uh, for a couple of weeks, and and the government just paying for it. it would have it would have paid for itself many times over, given what the result has been. But there was just a failure to recognize the seriousness of that of that sort of thing. Also, we have a different response in Sweden. Sweden has kind of Sweden, which isn't normally considered this free market open type of economy. It's more of a considered kind of a a, a uh, basically a social democracy type of country, even though it has a more conservative government government now, they have all the structures and the institutions in place of of what you'd consider a social democracy. And what the uh, and their response has basically been, um, let's let's just educate people on what they should be doing to try to be safe and and not try to institute a uh, closing down of businesses and things like that. That may and and it doesn't seem to be worth it doesn't seem to be working out that much more poorly for Sweden than it has anywhere else. So there's not a lot of, uh, so, so, so basically there, there's been responses all over the board, not necessarily lined up with the way, uh, with the, with, with the politics of, of any given, of any given country. You know, you understand the system and how, how sound the system is, uh, from, uh, predicting predicting crisis and predicting and have in, in stating the institution to deal with it. Mm -hmm. And it seems like, uh, you know, uh, free market economy uh, is more driven by, uh, you know, money and market and market gravitated toward uh, the area that makes money you know yeah and uh, and that and that actually is a is a fairly large debate going on right now um uh both politically and 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 behind the scenes and and, and now with a um uh with the entrance of a uh, pretty strong you know congressperson as a libertarian candidate for president they're kind of pushing the really pushing the free market side of this is just saying that you know what just people left to themselves uh can handle a pandemic like this better than government action can and it, uh, you know i'm not i i don't necessarily subscribe to that uh uh given as a you know as as given because i think there's a a pandemic is a class example of a, of a market failure where there is a public good in producing public health and so there's a reason for some sort of intervention from some outside non-market source to try to to resolve this um, however, on, on their side of it, it doesn't really look like government action anywhere has been particularly good at doing anything, rather than the U.S. or anywhere else. The, the, the places where, the, where it seems to be doing good, just from, from my own observations, is that places that intervened earlier in at least trying to educate people to be safer earlier or even just shutting parts of the economy down that look particularly dangerous, like restaurants and what I would say, you know, mass mass uh, entertainment venue type of places, restaurants, bowling alleys, movie theaters, things like that, um, uh, just shutting those down earlier. Um, uh, earlier interventions seem to do a lot more. And, and perhaps uh, as people learn to wear masks so that they're not contaminating others um, and educating people that wearing such masks are, are, are for other people, not for yourself, is, uh, you know, those things might be doing things better as, uh, as we look at them. But so far, the data really does look like government intervention doesn't seem to have been all that effective. So it's hard to argue with the libertarians who say we should have just left everyone else do it, um, do it themselves because uh, government actions, you know, and this is all over the world, government actions doesn't, doesn't seem to be very, have been very effective at, at doing things. Uh, well, I mean, uh, this is not a new thing. So we have the pandemic uh, before, you know, have the plague right. in, in, in London and we have the Spanish flu, you know, millions of people vanished because we let them to solve their own problem. Uh, right. And, 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 and part of that is that a lot of people seem to think that, you know, you hear the claim that this is the first time any government ever ordered lockdowns. That's not true. Lockdowns have happened for centuries during pandemics, even going back to the Black Plague and later. Yeah. Government would lock people down and people were said, hey, stay the heck away from other people, even if they didn't know what was going on or what was causing it, or at least had the wrong idea of it. Uh, Isaac Newton famously invented calculus during a lockdown in England during the pandemic of his era. So, so, it, so it, I mean, these, these lockdowns have been have been done for a while. 
in the 1918, the Federal Reserve made a very uh, had a very good paper uh, um, about 10 years ago after the uh, after the last financial crisis. Some uh, economists at the Federal Reserve did a paper on looking at the pandemic. They didn't even know about this pandemic yet. It was based in response to the H1. B1 pandemic that had, that had happened in, in uh, at that time where they were trying to say, okay, what would happen if we had a really bad pandemic? And they looked at 1918 to see. And what they found was that those cities, it was just, a, a bit, it, you know, Woodrow Wilson was present. They didn't have an idea what to do at a national level for a pandemic. So essentially it was the same response that Trump was having now. Um, there wasn't a large national working on the pandemic. But, but uh, individual cities all over, including Minneapolis, instituted their own lockdowns. And what they do, and what the data does show is that those few cities that did lockdowns, Minneapolis, St. Louis, a few other cities did lockdown, suffered much lower economic effects as well as lower deaths during the during the flu pandemic of 1918 than than the majority of cities that just left things open and let basically people decide for themselves what to do. So there is some reasonable evidence to say that yeah, actually some government intervention can actually both preserve the economy and uh, preserve lives at the same time. Uh, well, this uh, debate about public good versus individual freedom, and, you know, I've seen this guy that was a machine gun that marching to the Capitol and when I opened the economy, and, he, and one of yeah. the, uh, <laughs> you see one of these crazy signs that tells you, uh, lend itself to that debate. You know, one of them says, your safety is not my responsibility. So we're talking about social responsibility. We're talking about the government role of when we have a crisis. We've seen that in the series with the social programs after the depression. And uh, all the data shows us that uh, those social programs uh, uh, that they were instated by the uh, uh, were, you know, it worked. And the economy jumped three, four times uh, in, yeah. in an so we have the model, we have the evidence there, but when you politicize a pandemic for a political purpose, now that's when we have problems. Yeah, it, it, it yeah it does complicate it when you when you do it, and and actually there's been a lot of a lot of scholars have looked at this over the years, mostly in kind of the policy studies, policy implementation field where you're where you're studying how do how do government directives or any ideas or even just business directives actually get carried out on the ground by the people charged with doing them. And, and, and that goes back to my original thing on the, on the failure rate. And, what the, and, and some of the things that, the, one, of, one of the main theories of that that, 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 um, that people have is what we call, kind of what you could look at is what we call power resources. And you can look at any problem by an axis of ambiguity and conflict. And it determines whether um, how you know whether the likelihood of implementation is going to be uh, is likely or not, and it determines whether there's a whether there's a way of uh, complicating it or or what sort of resources a government uh, uh, policymaker might have to employ in order to have any chance of success. And uh, so, if you look at it that way, you can find that going across the ambiguity thing, a lot of these orders are pretty unambiguous. Stop, you know. Put a mask on if you're going to a place. You know, might be some close your business if you're a restaurant or a thing. So there's a lot of these things that are fairly and uh, and because you know, stay home if you have to. You know, don't go out and go about and and go up place. Just stay home and 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 harbor in place. Those are fairly unambiguous directives. Um, uh, and so it, and so when uh, if it, it's basically just administrative tools that that are required to do it. Just check up on, make sure that people are more or less following it, and try to intervene and. T- Educate people on on what to do, like the mayor of Chicago going around and visiting visiting house parties at night, say, trying to break them up. That's that's a that's what you call an an administrative uh, strategy to to try to deal with. As soon as you introduce conflict into it, though, it means that it it, it decreases the likelihood of any of that of of any of any order like that being carried out because all of a sudden there's conflict involved, and uh, it also it also determines different resources that people have uh, that that people have to employ. Mostly, you have to employ coercive resources to get to get people to react. Coercive resources can be a big problem, um, and that's basically the tools of violence is what we think of violence or detention or at least giving people tickets or something in a police. Basically, coercion, and um, that is a tool that I've seen a lot of, especially Democratic politicians, even even governors like the governor of Michigan, are not very willing to use coercive resources to do things, even when the opponents, so the opponents in the conflict. 
the opposition that's that's going actually shows up with very strong tools of coercive resistance with with uh, military style weapons. That's uh, and and so uh, and and something there is there are tools in policy and in the you know, for coercive resources, and unless uh, unless if a government is unable or unwilling to use those. Um, it, it makes it makes implementation of the, in these rules a lot less uh, likely to happen. And probably uh, the reason they are not want to use this resource, course of resources, uh, it's politics. It's not a sound economy. Well, it might be politics, but the thing with politics is that there's a the, the politics has an outcome. If you view if you politics as a as uh, part of politics is that is that um, a lot of politicians think of uh, only on the negotiation and the exchange side. What can I what can I give and what can I get to get to an arrived negotiation, and they and they ignore the conflict side of it. Mm -hmm. And it, and and really both sides of it are part of politics. You have to be able to be negotiate good good outcomes, but if the negotiation isn't possible, you have to be able to prevail in the conflict. You have to win. And if you don't win, you're not going to get your 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 your, your whatever your policy is isn't going to get implemented. It's going to fail. And so, and there are there are all sides of it that have to be looked at. And unless you, uh, if the opposition is willing to bring coercive action to the table, and you're not, then you're basically ceding that territory. A lot of cases, for example, the government of Michigan might not be able to because the law prevents her from from doing it. it gives people a right to do it. Plus, a lot of uh, police uh, law enforcement. Leaders might be unwilling to to do it, so so she may not have the course of resources to do anything about it, and uh, and and that be, that that's another reason for failure. People just might not have the resources. You might not have enough money to have a a, a policy like a pandemic uh, response plan. There might be enough money to, re to to respond. There might be enough. There might be a, not be enough people to follow you on whatever your plan is. A halfway or a middle of the road solution, which really doesn't deal with the problem in the long term, it's just short term solution. Like what the stimulus is, three trillion dollars. Who who's gonna get most of this money? And to yeah, for the yeah, Democrats yeah. to pass it on, they have to accept the Republican that the majority of corporation and rich they're gonna get those money, and that's what Obama did. Yeah, that, that, yeah, that's exactly right, and 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 that's what you know. People, a couple people in 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 political scientists call log rolling and other strategies that's that's done uh, to to essentially the way to think about it. And, and we're, you know, we're talking about quid pro quo pro outcomes. Is that you have to bribe a lot of people just to get one little thing. And so, for example, to get five hundred billion dollars for people on on uh, helping them out with their rent payments and and just some small and 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 their income that they're losing by not being at work, you have to be able to bribe a bunch of people who really don't need that kind of money, um, to, uh, you know, a, a trillion and a half dollars to to just to get that five hundred million for for what you want. And that's essentially the way to to look at uh, at, at how that legislation was passed. Interestingly, the legislation was not necessary. President Trump do, did have the power and has demonstrated that he has the power by winning a uh, 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 by, by winning an impeachment uh, uh, fight that that he uh, that 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 he has the power to actually you know pay people the pay pay people's uh, rent for them and order businesses to basically accept payments and and credit them as them and then and then the Federal Reserve can bail out those banks and those those hedge funds and, and pension funds that might be losing at the end of the long you know credit supply chain up to uh, you know uh, which which leads to lending when you pay a mortgage you pay a bank the bank pays their their lenders and those lenders pay a pension or a hedge fund which which bought the bonds for them on in the secondary market eventually someone's going to lose but 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 uh, uh, President Trump did have the power to intervene at that point and actually and actually do something fairly radical, and um, probably would be winning re-election now if 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 he uh, if he had acted that way. He didn't even need Congress to do it, but uh, his failure to act has led Congress to have to get involved, and and oh, really? con Congress is going to be basically going going to have to um, be a uh, trade-off game. That's what Congress is there for. That's what it's designed to do. You've got to basically get them. In order to get enough votes to win, you basically got to buy off enough enough people with uh, with uh, with things that they are, that, that they. On a, on a global level, uh, we have here uh, a rivalry that has been challenging the Americans for a, uh, for a few years now. There there was always a gap between the American economy, 18 trillion, whatever it was, and we have the China uh, lagging behind. 
And if this is going to hurt the American, we're, we're talking about uh, Americans' uh, economy it can be contracted about 30% or, uh, or 25%. And if the Chinese did not contract that much, that means the Chinese are going to get closer to the American and be a more uh, a strong uh, uh, challenger and strong uh, uh, competitor on the global level. Looking, looking at at least the evidence so far, I don't really see a big change in the geopolitical balance of power resulting after this pandemic than before the pandemic. Already, the United States had been a decline since 2016 because a president was elected who opposed U.S. leadership of the global polity that was created by the United States after winning World War II. The United States created a global polity and, and instituted the United Nations and, and tons of, of uh, institutional structures all over the planet to help govern this new global polity. That was, it's, it's really the remarkable thing that people overlook on what the United States did after World War II. It's, uh, it, but um, uh, with, in 2016, um, the United States elected a president who, didn't, who, who was opposed to that and um, had a large number of supporters who were opposed to what we call U.S. global leadership. Um, he's very interested in global, uh, in, in, in uh, national defense and, and, and keeping uh, people from other cultures out of, the, out of, what, of what is viewed as some sort of a, an American type of heritage uh, nationalism format. But, uh, but, um, it, but, but he was not interested in the U.S. leading the world on anything, and he has demonstrated that throughout his presidency. He, he rejects U.S. leadership. Helping, you know, helping him on that, 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 that also helps uh, two other very strong powers that are against U.S. global leadership, Russia and China. They're both helped by the fact that, that, that they have a U.S. president who also doesn't want to lead. So you have um, Trump and his supporters, Russia and China, who are all opposed to U, uh, U.S. global dominance of, of, uh, of the globe that the United States has enjoyed since the end of World War II and even more so after the end of the Cold War. Um, probably reach its peak under President Obama. What what um well, so so you have those three actors, uh, Trump nationalists, Chinese, and the and, and the Russians uh, and Russia. Those those three political actors really oppose U.S. global leadership, and the United States has basically lost its role since then. What what uh, what prevents the U.S. from really declining a lot in the balance of power due to the pandemic is that there is nobody trying to replace the U.S. as the global dominant faction in, in, in this global polity. Uh, 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 Russia and China do, uh, do not want to become the, the new U United States that's, in, that's, that's the custodian of this massive institutional structure that's been kind of the global world after world, the, the post-war uh, world after, after uh, World War II. They, they, they simply want to diminish U.S. power in that, uh, within that framework. They're not interested in replacing U.S. power, and um, as a result, uh, uh, it's it's hard to see anyone else unless until you get you get a complete replacement of the United States in a uh, structure like that. It's it's hard it's hard to see that the balance of power really changes uh, that much. Instead of just a kind of a minor trend toward eroding U.S. power that's happened over the last four years. The Chinese might not want to replace uh, the Americans' uh, global role, but uh... As you say, that that role has been declining, and that role uh, was depend uh, a lot on American soft power, which is competence, technology, culture, and this has also been declining. You know, America. Yes, yeah, yeah. People yeah, don't trust the Americans anymore, and that's huge. Yeah, it is huge. It, it is huge, and a lot, a lot. You know, what we call the social capital built up by the United States. Over uh, uh, over over a period, you know, it had its, it has its ebbs and flows. I mean, the United States had its major problems in Iran and Vietnam, where, where they really lost a lot of global trust. Um, but it also, you know, the 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 fall of the Soviet Union in the in the uh, the post uh, Cold War era, the United States gained a lot of trust, um, and then again lost it with the invasion of Iraq. But then was gradually regaining again um, under the Obama administration. But there, the, so so the whole, you know, what you'd call the soft power side. Um, that that's that has been ebbing and flowing, but but yeah, I, I would say in is certainly because because uh, the Trump administration is against uh, such you know against uh, focusing very much on soft power, 
and uh, and because it hasn't it hasn't really promoted that at all. Yeah, you've seen that decline, and it, it has reduced American uh, power abroad, American influence, and American uh, influence on how the world uh, system works has has definitely been been uh, reduced by that. I would say, however, that that I think your view of the of of the the British. Uh, after World War II is probably a, a, a rosy interpretation of what of, of what happened. The, the literature at the time, and if you look at if you, if you look at what diplomatic scholars were saying, basically the British lost their empire w- uh, in World War II. The uh, Japanese invaded, took it over on one side. The Germans uh, um, pushed uh, uh, Amer- and almost invaded Britain on uh, in the western side. And uh, the United States stepped in and took over the uh, the British Empire, took over the French Empire too. And and if you look at the map, took over the entire world. There, I mean, this was this was a world military conquest. This that's what it was. We don't call it that in America because we we it, it, we we don't want to be world dominators. At least our political politicians at least didn't want to sell us that way. But it was a, a dominant um, uh, military takeover of a of either empires allied with us or the German and the, the Japanese empires which opposed to us. It was, a, it, was a, it was a global dominance situation. Very quickly, the Russians and Chinese said, oh, we want out of that, and became rebels within that system. But um, eventually with the Cold War and with the Chinese signing into the WTO, um, they eventually rejoined that system under, under American custodianship. Now we have a president that's against that, saying, no, the U.S., we don't want to be the custodian anymore of this system, and we're not really sure we want anyone else to be either. We just don't like that system. And um, with that, it's kind of hard to uh, – that, that in, in terms of anything, I think is the biggest obstacle to uh, – to, um, uh, the, 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 biggest, the, the biggest obstacle to, to, to U.S. influence in the world as well as probably the biggest uh, uh, threat uh, to, to world peace that's probably happened since World War II. Uh, maybe we'll uh, end up with uh, uh, regional power. You know, like the Middle East, we have one region, Iran or Turkey, and in the South Pacific, we have China and America. Here, so we have minor superpower in each, you know, regional. Uh, yeah, exactly as the world looked right before World War One, which was which didn't that's... end up very well. <laughs> that, that's what it looks like. <laughs> that's that's a great regression here, which is yeah. not a bad thing. <laughs> That's what it is. I mean, it, it didn't have to be that way. Instead, yeah. the United States, which has never really been very welcoming of this idea of a global dominant thing, we've always had an isolationist faction. We've always had just a faction, a pacifist faction on the left that says, no, we shouldn't be, the United States is not, we shouldn't be globally uh, in charge. We shouldn't be the world's police officer. Yeah. And uh, there's been a large, you know, what you'd call a militarist faction on the on the other side that says, yeah, we should be the police officer. It's great for business, and it's and yeah. it's a it's a you know it's an important life mission for people who like that kind of work. And so so the, so so it's a um, uh, in, in, and so so it's a it's something that that uh, that certainly is out there. But 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 it, it's uh, the idea of. Uh, uh, of continuing that is always a, a difficult political push because there's a lot of people domestically who could have better lives if we weren't sending uh, so many resources <laughs> to military conflict abroad. And so that that's a uh, that's always going to be a difficult. So, uh, you know, let's end this. Uh, when we talk about make America great again. So I yeah. want to focus on great and again. So and we, again, have a, yeah. we have the place and what is again is what time frame are we talking about well i don't know i mean i mean the the the, the i mean the make america i i mean i, I guess you'd, you'd probably have to have ask someone who really subscribes to that to, to that uh, calling it, the, uh, what the great again what the great again i mean you had, the us under obama had probably reached its peak in terms of global respect and dominance there's a lot of detractors. A lot of other people didn't like you had you had uh, massive anti-American revolutions all throughout Latin America, for example. But they were all living within a system that that uh, that that basically allowed for for disagreement. I mean, you also yeah. had the Tea Party in Texas also opposing Obama and Washington. So it's not that much different than that. You have that's what that's what a global polity doesn't mean. Everyone's backing the same thing. If you go back to to similar imperial type of polities like the Romans or the Chinese or or uh, or the Ottomans and things like that, 
they never had some unified uh, group of, uh, of, of people all, all uh, agreeing with the king. What they had was just a, a system of uh, people basically abiding by some meta rule, meta kind of constitutional rules on how people should do things and how conflict should be resolved. And uh, uh, under under the custodianship of of some of, of some sort of governmental uh, uh, organization, whether it's a Roman Empire or the or the Emperor of China or uh, or, a, uh, or, or 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 the uh, Sultan in in, in uh, uh, the Ottoman Sultan or something like that. There's always been a system like that, but but we don't have a uh, we we there's never been an agreement. So it's not clear. That the United States, it's not, it's 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 not clear yet that the United States time has kind of come and it's decreased. What what is clear is that there's extreme conflict right now within the United States about what its role in the world should be, and that and and as a result of that conflict, the United States has been completely inept and inactive on on presenting this uh, presenting response to this pandemic that actually saves lives, uh, both within it, within itself and probably worldwide. Well, thank you, Jim Kilkoff, is a former chief economist for Agri Bank, and it's always a pleasure to talk, we speak with you. It's very enlightening and insightful. And. Uh, uh...